Hello there. My name's Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. At the moment, I'm sheltering in the wheelhouse of the charter boat My Way, skippered by Gethin Owen, who's just put the anchor down over Hollyhead Deep. The plan is to try for some of the big spur dogs and taupe that like to frequent this place. But unfortunately, it's not the best of days in terms of conditions. The tide is pretty much on the limit of being fishable in terms of size, and as you can probably hear in the background, the wind and swell is bouncing the boat about a bit too. On the plus side, we know there should be some very big fish down there. The past four record spur dogs have all come from here, and as interestingly, along with other records caught by Geth's customers, have all gone back alive. So in light of what was for a long time an insistence that all record fish be weighed on solid ground, my first question has to be, how did he manage to pull that particular trick off? Yeah, we've got three records on the boat. The Taupe, £79. Pound. Uh, the Smooth Hound, £25.6. I think that was the Stardy Smooth Hound. And Spur Dog, £19.13. When we caught the, the Taupe initially, it was in August 2005. I mean, it was a, it was a big Taupe, you know, £79. Pound. We measured it, the length and the girth, worked out the measurements, came out to £79. Took loads of photos of, uh, of Anthony. We knew he'd broken the Welsh record, and just short of the, um, the British record. We just put it back in and saw some away. I mean, no one wants to kill a fish just to claim a record. It, it, it's absolutely pointless. And it was only a couple of months later, when I was talking to Colin Doyle, who's the secretary of the, uh, the Welsh Federation, that he told me that the Welsh Federation changed their rules, that they were willing to accept record claims four fish that had been weighed aboard the boat, providing you got, you know, numerous photos of sizable objects, not just the angler, or you had um, the length and girth of the fish, they were quite happy. They'd, they'd sit down in the committee, have a look through your photographs, your claim, and then either give you a yes or a no. And presumably, the fish has to be weighed and witnessed in the usual way, except that in this case, it isn't being taken ashore. So length and girth measurements fed into a weight estimation table, which I do know exists for the top, are not going to be sufficient. No, it has to be weighed, or measurements, obviously accepted for the top, sorry, but on everything else it has to be, um, it has to be weighed on calibrated scales. They do insist on all these things, so you've got to have a calibration certificate. But any angler can take their scales to the local trading standards, and they'll calibrate them for them. The certificate lasts two years, and I think... I got mine done last year, it was only £25, you know, it's not a King's Ransom when it's based over, over two years and you've got calibrated scales there on your boats every time you fish. It's also worth pointing out that you can have scales checked after the event and the weight of the fish adjusted to reflect any inaccuracy. The other point here is that we currently have a situation where some species of fish, the tote being one, can't any longer be brought ashore and weighed. It would be an offence to do so, so for that reason Plus the changing attitudes of anglers who now see conservation as a major issue, something had to change. It's just a pity that the British Record Fish Committee are not as forward-looking as the Welsh. So with the Taupe and the Spur Dog, to get those records you really had no other choice. But the Smooth Hound is another matter. Currently, there is no legal protection for Smooth Hounds throughout European waters. There's none at the moment, no. And I'm starting to hear rumours, I mean they do eat them. Um, around Australia, New Zealand, places like that, and I think South Africa. So far here, they're not uh, a delicacy, but we all know from um, a couple of years ago there was the, the talk of taupe being landed for commercial gain, so it needs looking at the smooth hands now. Being just a little bit younger than me, your memory doesn't stretch as far back in time as mine, particularly on the subject of spur dogs. But do you have any recollection at all of how prolific these fish were before the longliners found they had a lucrative market for them and set about trying to get every last one of them out of the sea? I've read about them in history books. <laughs> no, I, seriously, I do remember. I mean, in the early 80s, just off Holyhead, you could, um, you could drift for 10 miles and bag up two, three double-figure spur dogs at a time on, you know, your big heavy set, like your big cod rigs and stuff like that. You could get them and you could fish all day long on a 10, 15 mile drift. But nowadays, I think my best day on the boat might be up to 30 spurs and that's in three and a half, four hours fishing in the deeps. We don't see the numbers that uh, we used to do 20, 30 years ago. So what sort of time scale are we talking about here from the days when you could hardly fail 
to the time when he could hardly find any left at all. From what you read, I'd say the tank was that a run again. Uh, the um, the town's guy, I think it was only a matter of years, wasn't it? You're looking at a decade, the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, when they became very popular on the European market, and everywhere you turned, there was a long liner out there, and they virtually decimated the whole stock within, let's say, a decade. Yeah. And now, thankfully, the Spurs are showing some positive signs of recovery, helped no doubt by current restrictions on commercial landings. But this recovery isn't uniform. It seems to be happening in isolated pockets. So what is the big attraction for the Spur Dogs in Hollyhead Deep? I'm not sure. It used to be a popular mark around Anglesey. So you used to get a lot of Spur Dogs running into the deep water here, or from north of Scotland all the way down. And we did see... We, well, we used to, 2004, 2005, we used to get quite a few of them to come up to the deeps. And then we started to see um, a decline in, in the numbers again. And then I think it was two to three years ago with all the work that Save Our Sharks and Ian Burrett and that did um, with regards to spur dog lining, that the ban came into force. If I remember correctly, they allowed, what, 5% bycatch yeah, on the spur yeah, dogs yeah. now. So um, last year we didn't get that many, but this year I've certainly seen the numbers increase. And considering that we were getting a decline over 2004, 5, 6, and then to virtually nothing, and this year Every time I come here, I'm almost certainly going to get one or two. But in the early season, April, May, when we used to come away with 20, 25, 30 on the boats, hopefully it's a good sign for the future. It's fair to point out at this stage that anglers fishing with you aboard my way have been responsible for the past four Welsh spur dog records, including the current holder. Do you think this might be indicative of a progressive year-on-year -year size increase now they are protected, which hopefully will continue upwards to its natural ceiling? The spur dog are slow-growing fish anyway, and we have, I think the old record was 17, 8, 17, 9, and we took it to 18, and then 19, 19 pound 3, and it currently stands at 19 pound 13. Bear in mind, I have had one over 20 pound, but that was before I knew about the change in the, in the record claims. So, um, Pete, you're getting a bite there, mate. Stop talking. Sorry about that. Just these anglers with backs to the rods. Don't send your backs to the rods. The stamp of fish this year has been quite big. I'd say the average size has been 12 to 14 pounds, which for a spur dog is big. But what a lot of people don't know is they are slow growing. Even the, the pregnancy on a, on a spur dog, the females carry the pups for, I think it's about 18 months. So it's a long time. It is a long time, yeah. Um, so you, you can see there just how easy it is. Because the pack fish, if you've got two, three thousand lines on the seabed, you can wipe out a pack fairly quickly. So it's going to take a long time for them to come back. Five years of the ban, we're what, two years into it? I think it should be another five years on top of that. So we're seeing a progressive year-on-year -year increase in size. But what about an increase in numbers? Are the bigger fish getting the support the species needs at the middle to lower end of the scale, which is essential if they are going to make any real attempt at a complete comeback? Definitely an increase in numbers. This year, last year, there was hardly any. This year we've definitely had an increase because I'm seeing them on every trip virtually. So it's going to be interesting now to see what happens next year. Are they in a one, two year cycle, three year cycle? I don't know. Um, so next year we'll be able to say a little bit better for ourselves exactly um, what's happening with the, uh, with the spur dogs. And what do you think is the implication of all this on future records? How big do you think the record could ultimately go? It's the British record, about twenty-one and a half pounds, something like that, or maybe a bit bigger. I know that's been broken a couple of times this year on the on the south coast. Broken, as in, you know, the anglers caught, weighed the fish, photograph, and brilliantly thrown it back. So the British record will always remain the same. Welsh record, yeah, I've, I've hopes that um, we can break that and we will be able to claim we're weighing on board. The big problem here, though, is that if you do catch a new Welsh record that is bigger than the current British record, even though theoretically it would be eligible for British record status too, as it stands, the British record claim would be rejected because the standards of proof are no longer the same for Wales and the UK as a whole. The British Record Fish Committee, to the shame, will not allow a fish to be weighed on a boat. Yeah, that's correct. For the British record, you need to, to basically kill the fish because it needs to be weighed ashore. Obviously, you're not allowed to do that now with spur dogs. So, um, the, the British record will 
will just remain the same. It's it's an it's an old antiquated system. It's about time you know the suits took note what the anglers want and looked at something different. Yeah, absolutely. Everything everything's open to abuse. Don't get me wrong. But if you've got plenty of photos there, maybe some size measurements, if we collect the data from everything that we catch, like they've done with the skate and with the taupe, if we do that for other shark species, spur dogs and smooth hounds, sizes, um, measurements, then yeah, if an angler's happy to put the claim in, he doesn't get awarded it, then fine, he's just got to accept it and go out there and catch one that looks obviously bigger and not just an ounce or two bigger. Let's take a look now at Hollyhead itself in more detail from an angling perspective to give a fuller picture of what the area is actually all about. Yeah, definitely. Can we do that in a minute? Because I'm going to have to get the net out now for Pete. <laughs> I don't need to stir the chilli. It's not always about the fishing, is it? It's about just having a bit of fun. Yeah. Um, it's like with this crowd here. Interview mode, yeah, mate. I'm being posh now. I mean, we've got, uh, we've got a transsexual on the boat called Martin. And <laughs> now Martin always makes a mean chilli, it's not just about the fishing, it's about having a bit of fun and enjoying your day out and Martin grows his own chilies and everything and he always does his, uh, does his proud with a big bowl of uh, chilli which, yeah, it takes a man to eat it, it's that hot <laughs> and uh, we all thought that was hot and then John's bought a, uh, a big bowl of chicken curry Rajasthani chicken curry, something like that. That's taking the inside of my mouth out. But <laughs> everyone's having fun. We've had a few small spur dogs, a couple small top, some hus, and uh, two or three bowls of chili each. With posh rolls brought by Paul, and then we've got fairy cakes for pudding. That's it. It's just enjoying it, isn't it? Oh, it is, yeah. it, it's good fun. So what's the crack with Hollyhead Deep in terms of the geography of it, the tides, the timing, all that type of thing? The deeps, it's a, it's a hard bit of water because you can only fish here on a deep tide. Anything over 27, 28 foot and there's no point coming out. You've got about a 50 minute run to get out here. Uh, it's 300, well it goes to 350 foot of water. We fish generally in between 180 and 250 foot and it's extremely tidal. So you leave it to the deep tides, you just get more time here. We get here about an hour, hour and a half before slack water. And we'll get up to maybe two and a half, three and a half hours fishing, depending on the actual size of the tide. And you're almost certainly guaranteed double figure fish in the means of um, hus, spur dogs, and taupe. And they'll they'll run here from from the beginning of April till about the end of October. So. The only thing that lets us down is the weather, the good old British weather, because you've got to have a, a fairly calm sea. Not so, like today. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, you can't feel us all thrown about here to, to get out here, because as I say, you've, you've got strong tides, you you're about eight and a half miles off, and you've got the tidal races of North Stack and South Stack to, to push through. And even on a calm day, they could throw up two or three foot seas uh, if the tide's pushing in the wrong direction. Would you say you're getting most of your taupe out here to get those elsewhere? No, most of them out here. You get a lot of taupe inside of Chirada Bay and in Hollyhead Bay, and they tend to, there's another little spur dog, um, you tend to get bigger ones, 50, 60 pounders, and sometimes a bit bigger. However, you're only going to get one or two. If you want to sit it out for the day, great, but I personally don't like doing that. You know, that those one or two fish are really worth seeing, and the they're excellent for the angler that's caught them, but what about the other six or seven anglers on the boat that have just sat there blanking, maybe with the odd dogfish or something like that? So we leave most of our taupe into the deeps here where um, you're only getting up to three, three and a half hours fishing, but you might be landing 50 or 60 double figure fish in that time between the eight of you on the boat, between, as I say, Spurs, Hessens. And where do your record talk come from? <laughs> it wasn't here. That was approximately two miles off the shore in Holyhead Bay, just off um, a popular mark called the Bolivar Rock. And it's only in, what was it, about 55, 60 foot of water with hardly any tide. And the lad who caught it had never caught a tote before. He'd, um, he'd been on my website, had a read up on, on tote fishing, there's a few articles there, a few um, examples of rigs, tied them all up, and away you go. But the funny thing about that, that taupe, we were meant to be in the deeps, we weren't fishing, is how sometimes days pan out. I had a problem with the boat that morning in that um, it wasn't firing correctly 
and had a lot of fuel. I don't know whether I picked up some dodgy fuel, but there was actually water in the fuel tank. So off the lads went to, um, I think it was to Tesco for, for a good breakfast for a couple hours, which gave me the time then to drain the tank, clean the filters out, and um, turn her over, and the boat was kicking fine then. But by the time the lads had got here, we'd missed the tide for the deeps. So I said, right, we'll fish big, we'll go here, and there is a chance of a tope. And Anthony Mary from Nottingham was rewarded with a 79 pounder. That's a nice story, isn't it? <laughs> is that the kind of very where you get your smooth downs from as well? Yeah, the smooth you can get the smooth downs from the Bolivar or from Church Bay. You do get a few in the deeps here. We, the last couple of years we've been having a little experiment because when the sun's shining they tend to go off the feed. Um, it's only in shallow water. Is it 40, 45 foot? So we've been playing about with the mud in the deeps and we've been picking up fish up to 17 pounds. On the, on the days where you know the sun's bright, so we'll come and have a go in the deeps, and it's worked. Was that piece going to fish on there? Smooth downs are without doubt the big success story of recent time. Not only do they appear to be increasing in numbers, they're also increasing their range as experienced by what Ian Burris is now doing with them up in Scottish waters. The main difference between Hollyhead and the rest of the UK is that anglers fishing from my way regularly catch some real monsters. How do you account for this? It's just I'm a good skipper. <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Um, we've been working the last few years with Ed Farrell from Dublin University and Ed's been studying the population and also the spread of the species, the common smoothhound and the starry smoothhound. And Hollyhead itself, I, I'm not too sure but it's it's the tides. It's a good run of tide there. But the, the, there's lobsters, the spider crabs, the shore crabs, edibles, velvets, everything that, uh, that a smooth hound feeds on. And obviously the bigger ones, the more developed smoothies, they can eat the, the spider crabs, you know, the bigger things, the lobsters and stuff like that. They have the powerful jaws to crush them. So maybe it's something to do with that or part of their... Um, the migration pattern, we're not sure. There's one thing for definite that we have noticed over the past few years that there does seem to be a two year cycle in, in the size of smooth downs. Because over the last six years, every second year, we've had the 20 pounders. We've had a few again this year. And next year, we'll get them up to 17, 18, 19 pounds, but I doubt it very much will break the 20. You mentioned there are two species, the starry and the common. But Ed Farrell's research very strongly points to them both being the same, with the presence or absence of spots being no more than within species variation. Something else the record fish committees are going to have to take on board. I'm also aware that a lot of the sample gathering, both by Ed and yourself, was done aboard this boat. So what are your observations on the current situation, and how do you see things eventually panning out? The, um, everyone knows, well, in the UK we have a common smooth hound which has no spots, and then the starry smooth hound which has oh, the, like, little stars, the white spots on its, on its back. Uh, Ed's done a lot of work. Now, there are genuinely two different species of smooth hounds, the common and the starry, but in the UK he set out to prove we don't actually get the common smooth hound. They are starries without spots. And from recordings of two, three, four hundred smoothies caught aboard my way, and then others caught in, in various marks around the UK and Ireland, let's say 25-30% we've marked as being common smooth hounds because they literally have no spots in them whatsoever. However, when he's got them back and, um, sorry, getting rocked about here, and he's gone with DNA analysis, he's proved them to be starry smooth hounds and he's yet to, to find a common smooth hound in the UK waters. He thinks that they, I mean, they're in South Africa, they're, they're in the med, but he, he doesn't think they actually travel this far. Just we've always called them commons because they've, uh, they've not got any spots on them. So the outcome of that, when it goes out to the wider scientific world, must be that the two record slots currently up for grabs will have to be consolidated into one. I definitely think that's the way forward. It, it has to be. Um, Isla now only recognise the smooth hound, not a common or a starry. They've just, as you say, amalgamated the two records into, into just the one. Another fish you catch in huge numbers here is the bull hoss. In my experience, probably as one of the guilty parties here, there is a fair degree of snobbery practised by regular dinghy anglers, and also, it has to be said, by some charter anglers who happen to be in privileged positions of having better things to try for, and these people tend to turn up the noses at the thoughts of fishing for bullhoss. Yet for many anglers, 
Bullhuss represent the best shot of them catching double figure fish on a regular basis. So how important is the bullhuss to your business and how do your regular anglers react to them as a species? I think they're great fun and it's funny you, you mentioned that, now you didn't mention that earlier when we were talking about it because I'll, I'll go back to one trip when we had um, last April when we got filming for the spur dogs and I mentioned about the uh, about the being quality bullhuss and you're looking at maybe 30, 40 sometimes double figure fish from 180 foot of water in a day and um, being the small boat owner who can go anywhere, I think your nose turned up a little bit, didn't it, Phil? When I said you should Phil do a little bit on the, on the bullhuss, which tickled me a bit. But you're quite right, sometimes a bullhuss is almost a guaranteed bet in, in many ports around the UK. And if the wind's blowing in the wrong direction, or you can't get here, you can't get there, it's just not happening. But you can turn you, your attention through to a bullhuss. And, and scale down your gear. I mean, some of the lads today, one lad's just reeled in, um, I think it was £10.12, but he's sat down knackered now, just having a little drink because he's just brought it up from 180 foot of water. And admittedly, even I thought it was something else because it was shaking its head a bit, uh, a bit like a small pack tope. But um, no. Jay's, uh, Jay's asking for the defibrillator. Yeah, probably. <laughs> As a natural follow-on from that then, what else has Hollyhead got to offer, both in terms of fish and of opportunities to fish by using sheltered marks to steal a day's fishing when boats working from other ports might struggle to get anglers afloat? This year it's been good weather-wise every chip fished, but um, no, you do get a lot of cancellations. I look, I mean the past five, six years obviously the skippers keep a log of the winds and what's happening. And I've been averaging between 65 and, and 75 percent trips in, so it's not a bad ratio. But this year the weather's been very kind. Uh, we've had, we've still had a lot of strong winds that have uh, sort of kept us in shore a bit more often than I'd like. But we've managed to get out. And even when you've got 25, 30 mile an hour wind blowing, um, if you've got the right tide, then you can have a day, you know, pollocking nothing big, two, three pounders. Ras, I mean, we just have a little giggle, we call it the Ras Grand Slam, where you go for a ball and a cuckoo, gold cine, rock cook, and the cork wing. Try and get all five, scale down your gear, and you can have a bit of fun. It's, um, some anglers are a little too regimented in that they just want the big fish, they just want a the fish they can take home to eat. The seas are not as, uh, as full as they used to be, so I think maybe as anglers we need to just maybe change our, our mindset a little and, uh, and fish for what's there. If you can't, get the skip, it's not the skipper's fault. The skipper can't always um, put you on to where you want to go. The weather's blowing too much and you can't get somewhere, but you can go elsewhere. Then have a chat, see what you can do, see what you can make out of the day. Yeah, I agree. Talking to the skipper, and more importantly taking on board any suggestions or advice he may give, does make very good sense. He is the local expert. In addition to him putting a boat under your feet, that's one of the main things you were paying him for. So taking this line of thought one stage further, I should also point out that having had the Welsh records for the tote, spur dog and smooth hound come aboard your boat, this could be no accidental coincidence. But it's always the angler that ends up getting the credit for these fish, despite the fact that as much if not more of that credit actually belongs to the skipper. So what do you think about my suggestion that the record fish list should also be given an extra column to record the name of the charter skipper and his boat? No, but that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> I don't know, I've never given that any thought. But you are right, because the skipper does have to know his stuff. He has to know where the fish are. I mean, some of the anglers don't see. Yeah, these lads are now sticking two fingers at me. <laughs> um, the skipper does a lot of homework and, and research on marks. Uh, we were talking on the way out here that you know there's a couple of areas that I want to, um, to to check out that I think should hold fish, but you can't just go there one day with, with some mackerel and some ragworm, put them down and catch the thin walkway. Oh, well, that was rubbish. You've got to go back at a different time of year, different state of tide, different hooks, different rigs, and this, any skipper worth his salt will be putting in that homework on your behalf. So hopefully, give you the best of your day when when you uh, when you go out with him. A good angler and a bad skipper is not a very good combination, but a bad angler with a good skipper, providing he listens, can still go home having had a very successful day. A novice angler too, as demonstrated by the tote record you talked about earlier being taken by that chap on his first ever toping trip. So being with the right skipper, 
and being willing to listen can make or break a fishing day. I think so, and if the, if the skipper knows, you know, every skipper should know his area at the end of the day, far better than the anglers. Um, so he should be able to help out, you know, an, an average angler or someone who's just new to the spot. Your novice says everyone's starting to learn somewhere, so a decent skipper will give you the eggs, help you prepare the baits, and help you catch those fish. Because at the end of the day, you pay our wages, or the anglers pay our wages, should I say. So the skipper has to make an effort. But don't get me wrong, I mean, there's, there's probably people that'll never come with me again because they've just totally got on my nerves, they don't want to listen, and they just make your job hard, so you lose interest in trying to help them and you get people like that on the boat. Well, I do, I'm sure I speak for many skippers out there. So the charter skipper is definitely entitled to at least some recognition for the good catches. I think so. I think most skippers put in, you know, um, the time and effort on those things. You know who your skippers are in every port who, who you know put in the effort for, for the anglers. So, so yeah, I suppose if you look at it like that, they should, uh, they should receive a bit of the recognition and it wouldn't take much to put, you know, the name of the port, the skipper and the boats alongside the, alongside the angler. Yeah, it's good point that. And just to illustrate that you are a keen angler, as well as skipper of the boat, you're also a retired Welsh boar fishing international too. Getting to represent your country, besides being a desire, either secret or otherwise, is probably to a great many people something of a complete mystery process. So perhaps a few words on the benefits, driving force and selection process for Wales wouldn't go amiss here. I'll also try to do the same for England, Scotland and Ireland at some stage, just to complete the set. I don't think there's any benefits as such, but it's um, it's the thrill, the thrill of the, the catch, the thrill of the chase of, the, of top slot becoming an international angler or an accomplished match angler. For someone wanting to start out in match fishing, then I'd say there's no hard and fast rule other than take the plunge. Just book yourself onto a few matches, maybe do a little bit of homework about the um, about the area, look at the point system that the matches are, are awarding per species. Maybe, for example, one point for a whiting, the sawbund, and the same for dogfish. Maybe a ras and pollock, which are a little bit harder to catch. They might be worth um, two or three points each. So, do a little homework on the rigs that you need to tie for uh, for those species. It should be pointed out that it's not just about the winning and the glory. It's also a very good way of becoming a more accomplished, versatile and consistent angler. Spending time in that sort of company, with the pressure of having to come up with a good result as opposed to simply wanting to, has to be one of the best teaching grounds you could possibly attend. Yeah, that's right. It's For someone wanting to improve, I think the match scene is a, is a good start. And starting block because you're going to see other anglers that are maybe more accomplished than yourself in that they can you know they, they fish the max uh, match circuit quite regularly they catch a fair number of species they win prizes but it's the best place for you to learn because if you go fishing by yourself all the time you're not really or even reading the magazines you're not going to learn so much but to see someone in action use seeing their rigs that they use the bait the way they cut the bait the way they prepare the bait and the way they actually handle the fishing rod the fish the, the reel the line there's no better place to start learning to improve in, in your fishing and even with the aspirations of becoming a match angler or a top international angler yourself but as with all good educations these days it does come at a cost it's not, as many people seem to think it is, a sponsored jolly for the chosen few. It's not, no. I think, um, I'm not too sure what the rules are with, with all the home nations, but in Wales, then you do tend to pay the vast majority of, um, of even just qualifying into the, uh, the international team yourself. There are, there are, you know, areas of sponsorship available to us that we do follow, but you still end up paying the bulk of, um, of just qualifying, let alone the international matches themselves, yourself. So you have to bear that in mind. The team trials in Wales that are four legs usually fished over two weekends, the Saturday and the Sunday, and they will cost you a minimum of about 150, 160 pound. But that does include the the boat costs for four days and the bait costs for four days. On top of that, depending on where they are, obviously you're going to have your your accommodation, an evening meal if you're not local, stuff like that. So. It's not expensive, but it's not cheap. 
so it's something that anyone who fancies the chances can apply for and have a go. You don't have to provide a recent match CV in Wales as you do for qualification elsewhere. Anyone with the aspiration to represent their country as an angler on the international circuit can have a try to do so and presumably become a better angler as a result. Yeah, every, every country is different. In Wales, it's similar to many sports. It's Welsh-born, Welsh parentage. Um, you can claim residency after three years in Wales if you've not fished for any other international country, so you can, you can try for the, for the Welsh team. But you also have to be a member of the Welsh Federation via club membership or personal membership. So really, the, the requirements, they're not that stringent other than, you know, being Welsh is part of it. And what's the structure of the actual weekends leading to qualification? The weekend itself, each day is set out into, um, how can I describe it, different zones maybe, to test your all-round angling ability. For example, it's a six-hour match, you'll have two hours fishing on mud or sand, so fairly, fairly simple, soft ground sort of fishing. Then you'll have another two hours anchored up in, or, or on rough ground and in a fast tide, and then you'll have a further two hours then where you'll be drifting for the likes of Ras, Pollock, Codling, Coley's. So it'll test your skill and ability through each different phase of, uh, of the day. And do you get any sort of advanced practice at these venues, or are you put in cold? You put in cold, it's up to you to do your practice before the qualifiers. Um, but again, as I, say, as I said earlier, the qualifiers is a, an ideal way to, to start you know, your learning curve and your improvement in angling. And then what happens then is the boat winner is awarded 100%. So just to keep things simple, say he catches a hundred points of fish, then the the second, third, fourth places on the boat, they're all worked out as a percentage of his, so hundred points, hundred percent. The next angler, if he's only got fifty points, well that's only worth fifty percent. In a full international match, all the bait is supplied so it's the same for everyone. Is it the same process for the qualifiers too? For as it is, everything is bait supplied. So the only thing that's gonna differ during the competition your tactics, your rigs, your hooks, your your line, everything, but the bait itself is all supplied on the boat and it's waiting there for you. So it's then divvied out between the um, between the anglers by the steward and the skipper on the boat, so everyone has an equal amount. There's no um, you're not allowed to supply your own bait or bring along additional bait with you. You have a set quantity, so bait conservation can play a part in it. You know, if you're banging out loads of fish at one go. Um, and your bait's running down, then you've got to start thinking a little bit more, maybe start using your bait for a second time. Whiting, for example, you don't need to change your bait. If whiting are there in numbers, you can get your whiting, take them off, put them straight back down, they'll be straight onto the bait that um, normally you'd change if you are just pleasure fishing. How many anglers per boat then make it through? Or does that depend to some extent on the numbers applying and the amount of boats required to accommodate them all? It all depends. It's set onto a league format then. How much of the four legs? You get your percentage and it all accumulates over the four legs. And then the top ten anglers go forward to form the international team. And the, the 11th and 12th places become the reserves for, those t for that team, should I say. Because normally they'll be going to either the World Championships or the uh, the home internationals and then each team takes one one reserve there's five anglers sorry in each team and again it's at your own expense it is at your own expense unfortunately including the practice it certainly is but the bait is supplied but the point system will be slightly different will it the, the point system can vary whatever you're fishing i mean it all depends on on the port itself perhaps they have an abundance of one thing more than the other so the points will will vary how then is the team prepared and managed on the day Tactics presumably are discussed, but are the team orders, or is everyone left to their own approach? You, I mean, you have your practice days, usually you'll go to an event, you might fish two weeks before for a couple of days to get similar tides to the event itself, and leading up to the event you might have two or three practice days, so you're testing out different rigs, different baits, different styles, and then of an evening you all sat down after your meal, you discuss what happened during the practice days, what's best, and then you might then change your rig slightly for the following day and see if your, your catch rate improves and it's just a process of elimination possibly the best way to describe it. Presumably there will be both team and individual medals to be won. So how then are tactics sorted out to give the team the best chance of competing for both? 
there's no individual tactics. I mean, it's you do the World Championships has first, second, and third for both team and individuals, and the home internationals has just the team events. So, if you plan your best, fish hard for your team, maybe in chance of an individual medal. That's my personal belief. Anyone who goes on there thinking just individually is, is not a team player and is not welcome. Are there then different tactics within a team in that one member might fish only for one thing and the others for something else to try to achieve collectively the broadest range of coverage? Uh, no, no. It's, it's usually based on the maximum points. So it's, it's up to you to try and achieve that boat win. Um, the world's usually on by yourself with seven other anglers from around the world. Uh, the home internationals, you have two boats of eight and a boat of four. So you get two people from each nation on one boat. So that means then it's up to you. It's no good having one person with 100% winning the boat and your next angler maybe having only 40-50%. It's in both your interests to have a high score, both of you on 90s or 190. Otherwise you could be overtaken by a nation. You might have 100% and said, your, your uh, partner in the Welsh team might have 40% so you return 140 but if two lads from another nation both return 90% they've earn 180% so they've ideally won that boat and with it being a team event you've got to play it as a team. I understand that stewards operate a rotation system on each boat to give, theoretically at least, everyone a fair crack at the more favoured positions but surely this can't work as the tide will also be a factor. You might end up landing the prime spot at slack water, so there has to be some element of look of the draw there in addition to whatever skill factor an angler possesses. In the worlds, you move position every hour and a quarter in the six hour match, so you may be on the stern, peg four, counting one, two, three, four from ports, uh, starboard side, and then after an hour and a quarter, you will move. Um, to a bow peg, maybe seven or eight on the port side. Not always an advantage um, because you may be in a poor position and not catching fish so you are relishing the chance to go over to the other side of the boat where they're, they're catching plenty but the tide's turning and you might find yourself you know, on a duff peg uh, all the way through the day. Currently you're a retired Welsh international but I hear on the grapevine that a return to the trials at least might again be on the cards. Can you confirm or deny this particular rumour? I was in the team as a team member for four years. Um, my last one was the World Championships in 2005, where we um, Wales achieved fourth position, which is our highest, and I got a personal ninth in the world. So I was quite pleased at that. Um, I've taken a few years out because obviously running the boat and family commitments and everything else. It is expensive. I make no no um, bones about that. So uh, there are other priorities, but. I'm getting the bug a little bit because I do enjoy match fishing, enjoy having a laugh with the lads and we've recently run the, the four legs of the Welsh team trials out of Hollyhead so actually standing and watching the lads fish I was chomping out the bit to get involved and uh, show them how it's done. <laughs> so we might be seeing you with your suit on again rubbing shoulders with the best of the best which begs the question then who on a consistency basis in your opinion is the best and is there any particular reason why? Oh, well, everyone knows about the Italians, they're, uh, they're world famous, I mean, they are very good anglers. Why are they better than others? Um, I think that they're professional anglers, they're actually paid to go out fishing, they receive a great deal of sponsorship from the government. They, they go out practicing at the venues on numerous occasions and it's fully paid for. They're on prize money to win events so there's a lot of motivation there for them and it keeps them going. I mean they have to have a natural ability because there's no just going out and practicing not going to be you know, the best in the world. But if you can couple the practice days, which don't cost you anything, with an ability, then yeah, you're on a winner. So you think that either taking part, or even attending as a steward and watching how the top anglers approach things, is a very good way of upping your consistency? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's how I got into my match fishing, um, to be honest with you. For two or three years prior to, to the f my first attempt at qualification, I was a steward. Uh, just watching because you stood there, you're marking everybody's fish as they come along, but you get to see the rigs that they're using, you get to see the ones that are catching and the ones that aren't catching, so you can come off the boat and think, hey, I'll tie a couple of them up and give it a go, and you will see your catch rate improve without shadow of doubt. And what do you think the future might bring for you in on the international scene? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Let's see if I qualify first. I have high hopes, we'll see.
before we finish, I think some of the lads out of the deck would also like to say a few words too. But this is one of the better boats certainly I've ever been on. The uh, Gaffin, you know, without blowing smoke up his ass to any greatest sense, is, is exceptional at what he does. Um, you know, eating chili. Former Welsh international uh, bragger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and has, and has currently got a knife to my neck. But uh, yeah, you know, he's a good skipper, and that's why we've used him for a number of years now. Plus, his, his record so far with the smooth downs, uh, you know, has it, been amazing. So, yeah, it's, you know, good skipper to use and very highly recommend. Well, we certainly cover quite a comprehensive range of subject material there, as well as giving a detailed insight into the fishing around this corner of Anglesey. My thanks then to Geth for taking time out between netting and disgorging fish to talk to me. Many thanks also to the lads on board for an entertaining day, plus of course the pan of chilli, which is bubbling away on the cooker like a thermonuclear reactor. Anyone wanting further information regarding fishing with Geth and Owen can go to www goangling.co.uk Once again, a very big thank you to all concerned.